This is the Breadwinner Podcast. Now, let's get into the show. All right, what is up, everybody? Welcome to the Breadwinner Podcast. I am your host, Tyler Harris, and I have got a special guest on today, and that is Mr. Patrick Bett. David. And man, I'm extremely excited to have him on. I'm going to give him a chance to introduce himself here in just a second. But man, he's someone that I've been following for a while uh, on social media. And I'm just blown away um, by the level of the quality of the content, the people that you're interviewing, this, the sphere that you have around you. Um, It's incredible. And I know that you have created that. And that's really what I want to get into. And so Patrick, man, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for being on the Breadwinner podcast and tell everybody a little bit about who you are, where you're from and kind of what you're doing right now. Yeah, so thank you for having me. First of all, you know, everyone's got to realize that you're a total stud yourself as well. You know, it's not every day a guy writes 2,400 life insurance policies in a single year, and I don't know many people that do that. So, so all your listeners, he may have a lot of guests, but you, you probably want to also listen to what he's saying as, as well himself. So my story is, uh, you know, fairly uh, simple. Born and raised in Iran. I lived there for 10 years. Uh, when uh, Khomeini died uh, after the war between Iran and Iraq, uh, we escaped six weeks after Khomeini died to Germany. I lived at a refugee camp there for a couple of years. Then from Germany, I came to the States, lived in Glendale, California, went to high school, uh, wasn't too good of a student with a 1.8 GPA. And right afterwards, I joined the military. I was in the Army for three years at the 101st Airborne Division, Aerosol. But I did live in South Carolina, which is a <laughs> city sounds like you're very fond of Columbia. Absolutely and, and, not. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> so right after the Army, I got out. Um, I wanted to be a bodybuilder. That was my dream, my aspiration at that time. I was going to be the Middle Eastern version of Arnold, going to Hollywood, you know, marry a Kennedy, be a governor, maybe going to, you know, do win, win, win a few Mr. Olympias. But, you know, life changed. I met a girl at Venice Beach. Um, her name was Jean Vier. Uh, we started talking. She worked at Morgan Stanley Dean with her at that time. And she was the advisor to most of the Laker players that you and I both know. And so we started hanging out and we started dating. And then I didn't know a lot about the industry. My parents, we've never owned a 401k mutual fund insurance. My parents have never owned a house before. I've never lived in a house before. I've always lived in an apartment complex. Biggest place we ever lived was a two bedroom. So we're not a uh, a wealthy uh, family. So she starts telling about stocks, money under management, Series 7. I said, I'd love to work uh, for uh, Morgan Stanley Dean. She said, you need a degree. I don't have a degree. She said, well, I went to UCLA. That's the minimum requirement they have. I said, it's not, it's not something I'm going to be doing. So she said, they won't hire you. So I took my resume and I put a cover letter on, front, uh, on top of the resume. At that time, we used to fax resumes mm-hmm. instead of the whole monster and jobs. And I had my best joke on the cover letter that I had at the time. And on the bottom of the joke, I said, if you're laughing, this is exactly how your clients are going to feel when they do business with me. You're going to love me. That's if you want to work with somebody like me, give me a call. I got uh, I sent it to 100 different uh, 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 BDs, Goldman. Mer- Goldman would have never hired me, but Goldman, Merrill, Schwab, <laughs> Smith. But I was so innocent. I didn't know what was what. I was 21. <laughs> so I got 30 calls. 15 of them uh, loved the joke but didn't offer a job. The other 15 offered an interview. I was uh, offered three jobs, uh, uh, one by Merrill, one by Morgan, two by Morgan. I took the one from Morgan Glendo. That's how I got started. So I went to Transamerica afterwards from Morgan Stanley. Then October of 2009, uh, I started a PHP agency, also in the insurance industry. Our focus is a little bit more on distribution. You're more on a machine that you have for selling term policies. And so uh, we grew the distribution from one office in Northridge, California, with 66 agents to 6,000 agents in 49 states. Now we have investors of Oscar De La Hoya, Gabriel Brenner, and Adelaide Group. You can go re- uh, search it on Crunchbase and kind of get a little bit more information about it. And we've grown. And accidentally, I started the YouTube channel that grew into what it is today. So I want to get into that. And I appreciate your that that was a great great actually great background and i appreciate your service too uh, in the military that is a huge part of who i am and who we are um, here with our company but man it's so funny what you said about that joke on the cover letter because i used to be a financial advisor that's what i did right out of college and i had a joke book that i kept right next to my phone 
And as I was calling these prospective clients, I would always lead with a joke to the point where if I called and didn't have one, they're like, wait, whoa, 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 uh, no joke, no joke. These are like the cheesiest, just dad joke, you know, the terrible jokes, <laughs> but man, I absolutely love that. Um, so what I'd love to start with is that transition from being in the corporate world to then starting your agency with PHP. Um, that leap that you took, what, what did that look like for you? Was that something that you started slowly uh, on the side or was it something that you just went head first into and, and cut bait on what you were doing in the past and just said, okay, this is, this is all we're doing moving forward. So are you saying Morgan Stanley to Transamerica or are you saying trans to PHP? To PHP. Okay. So when I left, I had a couple guys that I had a bad experience with one Lady name was Susan and another guy in the company that was one of the top executives in the company. Uh, and I just didn't like the way they did business. It rubbed me the wrong way. And I knew for a fact I couldn't be there for too long. So one day in the middle of the night, September 23rd, uh, I had already been processing my decision for quite some time. But I woke up September 23rd and I told myself we're not staying here. I resigned that day. Uh, left, started PHP agency. They sued us literally four weeks later on October 29th, I uh, which I send a, a picture of the lawsuit the other day on Snapchat and Instagram. Proudly, I keep it till today <laughs> because uh, I'm going to make sure all those stories are told one day in a very articulate way because I have a decent yes. memory. Uh, <laughs> and so there was a chip. There was a point. You know, I interviewed Barbara Corcoran uh, a few weeks ago, and I oh, said, nice. what's one of your biggest motivation? She said, somebody told me my ex-boyfriend told me that I was never going to succeed without her. And so a lot of these guys would tell me to follow and they would say, why don't you think I left to start my own company? Why do you think I didn't do it? Because it's so much hard work and you don't want to do it. And I'm telling you, you're not going to make it. No one's ever going to make it. And then there was some activity that was being done that I wasn't too excited about. And so I made the transition. And what I learned instantly about the world of business is somebody could be your friend today, but the moment you become their competition, you're absolutely enemy of the state. You're a target. They are wishing for you to be out of business tomorrow is what they want. I mean, they want you to be out of business the next day. And so we started up and uh, I knew one rule. There's one thing. If you want to compete with me my entire life, this has been a philosophy, philosophy that's worked for me. Uh, if you beat me, it's because you're going to have to out improve me, outwork me, out strategize me. And last but not least, outlast me. There's a very kicker. They would outlast. You could beat me for a year, three years, five years, 10 years. If you want to go 50 years, I'll go with you because I'm going to go that long. So yep. that's not a message most people are excited about. Here's why most people are not excited about it. Most people would much rather have a lifestyle of here's my house. Here's my car. You know, I'm a millionaire. I live in front of, a, you know, a, a, a lake house. I live on the mountains. I live in this, uh, uh, you know, house all the way in the top of this building, you know, and look at me. I worked hard. So one day I don't have to work anymore. That's not what I subscribe for. Uh, to me, being a millionaire is automatic. This is America. If you don't make millions in America, truly, you need to go to a different country to realize yep. why it's so easy to make millions in America. Absolutely. So the money should be an automatic. But the purpose has got to be bigger. And once you identify your purpose, it's kind of tough to compete with you. I mean, I agree with you 100 percent. And one thing that you said there, the money is the money is automatic. But but your purpose and your just fulfillment comes in the process. Like it's the process. And and I think that's so rare in people these days because just like you said, it's a means to an end. Things are a means to an end. Things are a means to an end. I had to, did a video the other day where I was talking about that phrase and I'm like, wait a second. What if the means actually was the end? Like it's, it's not the means to get somewhere. Like what if it was the, me like that's, that's it. Like that is fulfillment in the means being <laughs> the end. And it's such an interesting uh, concept. So you left, you started, they were not happy. And that chip on your shoulder has got to be the greatest motivator of all time, right? It, it was the second greatest motivator of all yeah. time. The greatest motivator of, of all time for me uh, was uh, when we left Iran, we came to America. My parents, my mother's side, they're communists. My dad's side, they're imperialist. Wow. And I wanted to, you know, I grew up very confused because, you know, on one side, my mother would say rich people are greedy. On the other side, my dad would say poor people are lazy. So who's right? You know, it's a debate. <laughs> like, th this isn't... 
you know, uh, Obama and Trump debating, you know, yeah. what ever happened. This is like day to day debate I experienced. Mm. But to me, it was more uh, in 08. Uh, I have to tell you, in 08, my temper was probably the worst it's ever been in 2008, hmm. Tyler. And, and the reason why I was uh, um, like that is because, OK, so I found a girl that uh, was going to end up being my wife, who's my wife today. We have three kids together. I found an industry that allowed me to have an incredible life. I learned a lot, including being in part of that company, Transamerica. I learned a lot from a lot of people, good and bad. So I found the industry. I found the country I'm going to be living in. I found the wife. I made the money. I heard the magical words from my dad, which is, I'm proud of you. My mom and dad saw me winning. My friends who, you know, I was the kid that, you know, nobody would have put as somebody that's going to win, saw that happening. But it had to be deeper than that. So I, I pulled aside my five advisors that I had at the time. And I said, look, I really need your help. I don't know why I'm wired like this right now. My temper is a little bit off. I'm really I'm getting my fuses short and I got to figure out what I want to do next. because I don't think it's just money driven. If it's just money, you know, that's got a short lifespan. If It's got to be bigger than that. So I went and met with a guy who introduced me to a man named George Will. George Will was one of Ro Ronald Reagan's advisors. And so I had dinner with. George Will, Pat Boone, and a couple other guys, Larry Arn, Larry Greenfield, and we had dinner together at Miramar Hotel in Santa Monica. And I asked George, I said, George, you know, um, I'm trying to figure out what I want to do with my life. And he says, well, let me ask you, where are you from? I said, I'm from Iran, all this other stuff. And he said, why don't you go study why 40 million immigrants come to America and why America is number one in having the most immigrants here? Why? Why don't people go to you know, other places? Why do they come here? So I went and studied that. When I did, I contacted the Reagan family. I got very close to the Reagan family for that six-month period. And I started studying everything about capitalism, all the other sides. Then my obsession went to hold it from level with the concept of entrepreneurship and capitalism. Once that clicked, hmm. I knew for the rest of my life, I am going to spread the message of capitalism and uh, entrepreneurship to the people because – the moment a guy like Tyler figures out that you can use your talents to create something, be part of a community to, you know, address a certain need or help other people advance as well and have property ownership of what you're building. There's some special that happens to that human being. And I want to see more people experience that. That was number one. Number two was just an extra dessert. You know, number two is <laughs> almost like a, the fun fact of it. But number one was the real purpose. That's going to be a lifelong mission that I'm going to have. And so what it sounds like is it, it went from your head to your heart. It went from being about taking care of me and taking care of my family to now that I've done that. And only until I did that, then can I go out and teach other people how to go do the same. Take that personal responsibility uh, is what it is. Uh, man, you talked about how you, I think you used the phrase stumbled into or fell into something within the social media and YouTube. And I want to talk about that with Valuetainment. I know it was, it was one video that initially was like a huge, just 30 million views or something like that. It was an incredible viral video, but what was it that got you interested in even playing in that area of social media and putting this stuff out there and kind of how did that evolve over time? Yeah. So he, here's here's what happened there. So, you know, just think about for for decades to be able to compete with the market when it comes down to media, you have to go through NBC, yep. ABC, you know, CBS. You got these networks you got to go through and they have a monopoly, all of them together. They can bully you mm -hmm. and they can choose who they want to choose. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's the best talent in the world. And all of a sudden, one day, a platform comes out that's free for you to be able to compete with NBC, ABC, CBS. And that's when we really start finding out who's got the real talent that's willing to do the work regularly until eventually they're noticed. Yep. So first of all, that's that's purely a free market, right? So then you dabble into it. And when you dabble into it, the question you got to ask yourself is, are you good enough? Mm -hmm. You may not be. And you have to be, you know, the one thing that I'm very clear about is, realizing if I can compete in a certain space or not. So then you realize, okay, if you have a good voice, you can be on podcast, okay? If you're not a good voice and you don't like to do anything with voice, but you're a good writer, you should write a blog. If you're not a good writer, you always have these grammar mistakes. You know, you, you can maybe 
but you look good and you speak good, maybe you should do YouTube. If you can kind of put them all together, then test YouTube. So we started testing. And for me, believe it or not, the first content that went viral is a, <laughs> is a content I wrote a, a day after the movie came out, Limitless. I don't know if you remember the movie oh, Limitless. Yeah. Absolutely. With, uh, uh, with uh, what's his name, Bradley Cooper. Yep. So I wrote a blog and the title was, Did Einstein Use NZT? Okay. <laughs> and NZT was, yep. was the, the, the pill apparently, right? And I got, I got, there was hundreds of thousands of views in one week. <laughs> And everybody was contacting me, asking me, do you have NZT? So I became an <laughs> NZT dealer yes. for like a week. Awesome. <laughs> and I'm sitting, I'm like, listen, and I was having so much fun with, I'm like, these people actually believe that there's an NZT <laughs> people I can sell them. So, you know, that became the first thing. And then, you know, I, I said, let me test this YouTube thing. We started off with two minutes with Pat. And then all of a sudden, when we made that video, Life of an Entrepreneur, it's so funny because I posted it on YouTube on October 30th, 2015. Mm -hmm. So I posted on October 30th, 2015 on YouTube. In the first 24 hours, it only got 2,500 views. That's it. So it didn't do anything on YouTube. Yeah. But then I, I, and I changed the title and I put it on Facebook and I changed the title and I put it up on Facebook October 31st at 3.13 p.m. And I'm about to leave to Halloween. And I posted it there on Facebook. It got 30 million views. But that Facebook didn't contribute to YouTube because they're two different platforms. Because today, Life of an Entrepreneur on YouTube, it's at 2.7 million views, nowhere near to what happened with the Facebook. Wow. And then things started growing. And uh, I, I'm fascinated with business and entrepreneurship. So I started talking about that. And then it really started growing. So with all of my social media and these things, and I just dove into this 14 months ago, and with podcasts and the vlog and all the different things we're doing, I don't monetize any of it. I don't sell anything on it. It is 100% paying it forward and providing value for the life change that happened to me over the last three and a half years and the mentors that came into my life and wanting to do that for somebody else. And I'm always inspired when I see other people that are that are doing the same, like your your videos, your content. It's not, hey, and go buy my ebook and go join my mastery and go to this and that. And it's not there's no right hook coming after every video. So talk about that a little bit, because what I call it is is scaling impact. You're just scaling impact. And if value is the goal, then you will create a life out of not ever having to ask anything from anyone, but just by providing that disproportionate value uh, over time. So every minute of the day that you spent creating a video, posting, producing, creating content was minutes that you weren't spending that were income producing in your business. So what did that look like in your head as far as justifying and kind of knowing that what the end goal would look like? Well, initially, the videos were specifically purposed for the agents. It yeah. wasn't it wasn't at all. It. Uh, there was zero purpose. Like I would put it on this channel and I would send it to my guys and they were it watching. It happened to be public. Yeah, it would get 100 <laughs> views. 100, and honestly, we didn't even know what was unlisted and what was public. We didn't know the difference. Wow. We had no idea what was going on. Wow. And uh and by the way, a guy like you, you stick around two, three years, you, you're going to blow up because you got talent and you're real. Your eyes are not uh, loopy. You're fire. You got fire behind those eyes. So you're not trying to mess around with, uh, with people out there. Here's, here's what you got to realize. A guy came up to me the other day. Uh, I coach five CEOs. And these guys I coach is guys that I like. And I like the guys with what business they're doing. So they come once a month and they spend an hour with me. And when they come in, they, these are people that are outside of the business that I run. So this one guy comes up to me, says, well, I want to be this. And he makes three and a half million dollar a year income, which you got to respect that income. Mm -hmm. And does very well for himself. Young family, kid, wife, the whole nine. He says, I want to be this. I want to be this. And I want to be this. And I want to be this. I said, you know, I, I said, listen, before, you know, one of the biggest challenges today is there are so many things for us to see that we can say, I want to be like him. I want to be like him. I want to be like her. I want to be this. I want to. The, the, the sooner you can figure out who you really want to be and stop comparing yourself on what everybody else wants to be, then you have to position yourself in that, in that place that you want to be. Meaning, for instance, you know, Jerry Springer, you know who he is. So I'm with Jerry Springer. And Jerry, most people don't know, he was a former mayor of Cincinnati. Jerry ran for office. He was in politics for the first 10 years of his career. Brilliant guy. He had a couple in interesting incidents that happened. 
Then he started doing local TV. Then he got offered to do a show. And at that time, the competition was, you know, Oprah Winfrey, all this other stuff. Then they shifted. And then one day, Jerry, 10 years into Jerry Springer's show, he said, hey, I see what these guys are doing. Maybe we should start talking a little bit of politics because I can do that. The moment he did it, it dipped. Hmm. And one day they sat down and they said, listen, your audience doesn't care about your political opinion. Your audience wants to listen to you talk about Jerry, Jerry, (laughs) Jerry. Today we have Mary. Mary's pregnant with you know, her sisters, uh, husbands, uh, you know. Okay, so what are we going to do here today? And they fight, right? And yeah. the other comes up. But that's his M.O. So if he chooses to change that M.O., he doesn't. He, it's as if he has a zero audience to start off again because mm. that audience is only wanting to have Jerry. So I get a lot of people that call me and they'll say, Pat, I want to start a course. What's your outcome? I want to make money. Great. Hey, what do you want to do? Should I start a course? Should I do this? All these guys are telling me I should get on them. You know, there's people that will call you and tell you, you should do courses on our website. You should do courses on our website. Mm-hmm. We have it better. And if you, in this game of social media, you got to also be careful because if you get into a click in a circle of people, mm-hmm. I judge you that you're like them. I just, I don't know if that makes Absolutely. sense or not. I don't know if that makes sense on the social media. Like if I see you with a click too much, you're them. And if I'm not them, I'm kind of like distancing myself because that's not the game I'm playing. I'm playing a different game Absolutely. than some people are playing. And you have choices. You can do that. Um, luckily for you, you don't need the money. Mm-hmm. You know how to make money. You run a real business. Yeah. So believe it or not, you have an edge for not needing that additional money to make to do. While other people, they have to say, stop, 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 stop. Before you do anything, in the next 30 seconds, I'm going to show you three different steps on how you can make money on Instagram. In this class, you got to go on this webinar that I'm going to be doing. And you're going to learn. And you get $249 today. And, and then they do a video. And it's everything you can find for free on YouTube. But isn't, isn't the problem just that? That they don't have the money because they hadn't done it. They're just... Earn yeah, income on telling other people how to do it. I wouldn't do it. Exactly. I, I'm, I'm telling you, I wouldn't do it. But but there's a lot of people that will do it. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. if they want to do it, you know, you let them do it. That's uh, that's it's like a, a guy selling infomercial in the middle of the night. I, I'm I'm probably not going to be doing infomercials middle of the night. But if a guy does it and they make money with it, Absolutely. let them do it. You got to figure out who you want to be. It's by far the most important thing. And and let me say this to you, because a part of that question you ask, I feel it's not for your audience. I I feel the question is for you. Tyler, you're a talent. It doesn't take a long to figure it out. This is not an audience message. You can bleep bleep this out or keep it to do whatever you want to do. You're a talent. You're a good looking guy. You have a beard. You look very interesting. You're smart the way you speak. You have an intense side. You have a humor side. You have a likable side, a charisma side. Look at the board and figure out where you want to belong. And don't compromise because there's a part of this industry that you can be a prostitute in this industry. Mm. And what I mean by being a prostitute in this industry, it's it's very easy to say, oh, my gosh, I also want to go do that. And I also want to go do this. Stick to your core principles and values that you want to build your brand on. Don't compromise it. I really appreciate that. That makes a lot of sense. Tell me one thing that you quit doing that enabled you to succeed. I mean, I was a, I was a big time chasing skirts from morning till night. It was my priority. That's what I did. I mean, I can tell you one year I went to Vegas 26 times a year and I was very committed. Um, I used to go to the casinos. I played poker. I used to play blackjack. I gambled a lot, uh, from 21 to 23 big time. I still love playing the game, the rush of doing that. Uh, the rush of, you know, new girls and getting after it and partying and doing all that other stuff um, and drinking. I would, you know, I think in the army one time I tried to finish all the, you know, tequila in Kentucky. I failed miserably <laughs> multiple times. I just couldn't do it. But I tell you, in the army, we would drink heavily. I mean, you guys deal with military guys. Military guys typically know how to party because we work so hard that we have to go release it somewhere. Uh, And so I, you know, I quit having sex for 17 months. That was the craziest thing I did. And it was the hardest thing for me to do. My friend said, you'll never do it. 17 months, I went cold turkey. I went seven years not drinking a single beer, alcohol, wine, champagne, nothing. Seven years straight, I cut everything. And so for me, the moment I decide that I'm going to cut something, I'm cutting that thing until getting what I want to get. So the list is a long list of things that I gave up, but those things work for me. I'm not trying to tell people to 
cut sex and they're married. And some people mm -hmm. send me messages and said, I've had no sex with my wife. I said, listen, that's, <laughs> that's you, not what you're talking about. <laughs> you got, that's not what I'm saying to you. But you could you, for you, it could be video games. Some people now they struggle with porn. Some people drug with cocaine. I got guys I'm dealing with that can't stop doing a line of coke every day. There's a lot of different things that people struggle with. Those were my things. Absolutely. You've interviewed. <laughs> the lineup is incredible. What was one guest and I don't want people to ever answer a question that uh, alienates any others that were incredible, but what's one that you can just think of off the top of your head that made it a significant impact on your life and how you viewed things after that interview? On my life? On your life. Oh, okay. One person that you interviewed that you came out of that interview and you're like, man, that really, really impacted me. That impacted my life. And the way you view the world, the way you react to things. So are you talking about the ones that I've done on, on, on YouTube or, yeah. or things that are not on YouTube, like outside of YouTube? I would be open to any, but the only ones I've seen are, are the yeah. ones on YouTube. Well, I mean, I would tell you, George will really impact my life. I mean, okay. He may look at things in a whole different way. And I've never interviewed him. I've never yeah. uh, uh, put him up. Um, you know, I could tell you uh, Michael Franzese, the way he, you know, viewed the level of forgiveness he had to have is for his father after his father is the one that kind of, you know, threw him under the bus and he ended up going to jail because of his own father throwing him under the bus. And he still goes and takes his dad out of prison after being in jail for what, 66 years or something. Wow. I mean, I don't know a level of forgiveness higher than that for a guy to be able to do that. So that message there of forgiveness, um, you know, Gianluca Vacchi was interesting. The guy who's the most interesting man in the world. He's got like 12 million followers on Instagram who, yeah. You know, at one point for him, he says, the motivation of acquiring more money was gone for me. I no longer had it. And so there's an element of that when you really sit there and think about it, that a hustle to go get another dollar to compete against another guy and you having a nicer car or because, you know, nowadays anybody can lie about their net worth. You know that anyone can post their net worth up there. And what can you do? Yep. Somebody can say I'm worth, you know, seven hundred million dollars and you just kind of have to take him for it. You can't really say anything else. And then you go do research. I'm famous for asking the tougher questions. I'll say, how'd you make your money? You know, and their answer is always, well, it was, you know, some stock I bought that was a penny stock. And, you know, you know, there's BS there or some Bitcoin thing I invested in. You know, there are people you can tell what kind of money they made when they sold their business. My name is Mark Cuban. I sold my company for $5.3 billion. I own 60% of it. Yes, you're worth $3 billion, right? <laughs> so, you know, some, some of those characters that you interview with and, the things they say where you kind of like, I never thought about it this way. Yeah, um, yeah, it, it makes you think. I would say those would be some of them. Okay, man, I'm, it's so funny you just mentioned that about uh, what someone's worth and how anyone can say anything. Yeah. The vlog episode, the Daily Bread vlog that's coming out tonight, which, what in the world, what is today? Today's the 23rd. That's the entire theme of the, the vlog tonight is I talked about how interesting it is when you just ask somebody and how I'm always intrigued when I just say, Hey, what was your, uh, what was the AGI on your tax return last year? And it's not so much like, I don't care what the answer is, but I love seeing how people respond to the question. Like it's especially on social media, there is so much fake filtered just facade of this success and this living this lifestyle. But at the end of the day, like how much money, like how much money are you actually making? And I'm so intrigued by those that are just willing to be transparent and just go out and just say like, Hey, this, whether it's 50,000 or whether it's 50 million, it doesn't matter, but it's real. And people want to connect with real people. Yeah. And that's just huge for me right now. And, and I'm going to tell you, that's going to help you out long term. You know, I like I like docu documentation. When we started a company first, I said, I'm going to give equity. And everybody said, really? Yes. And the negative reputation of a, another competitor who said they're going to give equity, who when he first initially started a company was one of these, we're going to give equity. Like, yeah. don't worry, Taylor, I'm going to take care. I'm a, don't worry, Tyler, I'm going to take care of you. Right. Yeah. And I'm not a guy like that. So what I did is I said, look, guys, um, our law firm is Cooley Law Firm. Cooley Law Firm took Facebook and Google public, okay? Here's your equity documents. I want you to take it to your attorney, have them contact our attorney. Then, when you're comfortable, sign it. You have 30 days. 
So that's the reason why we gain credibility with the people that we have, that we don't lose a lot of agents from our company. Yeah. And the only reason we do is because we either terminate you or, you know, you just don't want to uh, hang tight to standards. Yeah. It's, it's also sometimes, you know, there's insurance world, mortgage world, sales. There's some people that want to push the envelope to the point where it's past gray area. I understand there's gray areas sometimes that you're dealing with some things, but you go into the really, really the other side. I, we don't have any tolerance for that. But for the most part, this is why I ask the question, how did you make your money? Yeah. And that question, some people don't like. Uh, and, and, uh, only, you know, the only ones that don't like it though, are the ones that have been portraying maybe something different. You're Would right. You agree? No doubt about it. No doubt about it. And you know, listen, there's, there's a couple things. There's a couple things about it. There's a part of it where it's like, you remember when, uh, well, hey, I don't know your age. You look like you're 28, 29, but you could be 33, in your 33. Okay. So you're 33. So, you know, when you're 23 guys brag about how many girls they've been with. Sure. Right. And you know that's so like how many you've been with, bro? Forty-three. You know, it could be thirteen, but there, you know, it's, there's always that, you know, socks in the crotch type of mentality where like you have no idea how big I am, bro. You know, I yeah. should have been a porn star, but you know, all this stuff. You know, that kind of doesn't change even when men become forty-eight, forty-nine. You know, and so, and and you you want to feel like you always have to make up for it. And then there's the other side where it's like, listen, we had a debate the other day. OK, I don't know presidential which side you on. If you're on Trump, if you're on Clinton, it's irrelevant which side you're on. But this is the conversation that we had. I don't want to go into the political side. This is the conversation that led to the conversation was every time we have a lunch, I ask questions and I want to know what people are going to say, because it leads to good conversations. I said, let me ask you a question. You know, does evil win? And they said, what do you mean? Does evil can evil win and get away with it? Can you do everything wrong and still get away with it? And somebody said, no, no, because eventually the evil, you know, they're going to come up and they're going to get caught. I said, is it true, though? I mean, I know a lot of people that got away with murder and, you know, yeah. they're in the marketplace is a very nice person. I think it depends on your definition of when. <laughs> right. So so for them, obviously, it's a loss because you have to live with it for a long time. But, you know, for the uh, I guess what I mean is audience, like people out there that are watching. Right. Okay is the audience's interpretation of them. Oh my gosh, what a great, okay. you know, person this was and that person was. Eventually it comes to a point um, where, in my opinion, evil does sometimes win in this world, mm -hmm. you know? In, in today especially, oh my gosh. <laughs> Dude, let me give you a funny story. This is a funny story that, that you can decide whether you want to edit this, edit this or not. <laughs> we had a guy in the army. This is one of those funny, hilarious stories that he would say, Pat, Listen to my pickup line, okay? This is my pickup line. He'd go to the bar and says, watch. He'd go to the hottest girl and he'd make a round with 10 of them. And he would go and he would say, guess what? What? I have the biggest you know what in this entire club. And she would say, get out of here. So I have the biggest in this entire club. No way. Yeah. Here, go home with me. <laughs> One out of the 10 would always say yes. Now, this guy was 5'6", 120 pounds. <laughs> Okay, one out of ten would go home with them. But then once they're in the bedroom and it's done, you know, no one's <laughs> asking the question. You lied because he still got what he wanted. That's today's social media is that. That is today's social media is guys are getting up there and talking about how, you know, what they are and people are buying it and they already bought the product, so it's too late. I think it all comes down to who you want to be, man. That's the thing. You know who you want to be and. What kind of a life you want to live and still have a creative marketing side to tell the story that gets the audience to want to be uh, attracted to your story. But aside from that, you know, if, if I can go to sleep at night, I sleep like this. Yeah. I'm gone. OK, as literally I sleep like this. I'm gone. If I put my head down, I'm totally gone. I'm going to do my best to make my marriage work. I'm going to do my best to be a great husband. I'm going to do my best to be a good citizen. That's my business. That's yeah. what I have to do with my life. Yeah. But for the, all the other stuff. You know, make a decision who you want to be because you can get up tomorrow, change everything on your Twitter profile, Instagram profile, and talk about how rich you are. And most likely, 90% will believe it. That's true. Patrick, where can people find you online? Oh, you know, you just go uh, YouTube, type in Patrick Bay David or Value Tainment, and you'll find it all over the place. So if you just type in Patrick Bay David on YouTube or Value Tainment, you will find it. Who is one person that you would like to hear? on the breadwinner podcast. 
who is one person that I'd like to hear on Breadwinner Podcast? Um, I don't know. Who would you want to have? Because it's a question you got to answer, right? Who would you want to have on your show if you were to pick somebody? One of the ones I'm trying to get right now is Lewis Howes. I'd like to have him on the podcast. I don't think it's going to be a challenge. No. I've, no. I've sent some emails and trying to make some in routes and some connections through some people. But I think you and Lewis would do very, very good together. I will send a message to Lewis as well myself uh, to let him know for him to feel very comfortable um, being interviewed by you. And it shouldn't be a challenge. It's just going to be a scheduling thing with him. I, I greatly appreciate that. And, man, that – what you just did to flip that question is pretty much the definition of integrity. So I appreciate you doing that. Um, and man, I appreciate you for being on the podcast for spending 30 minutes with us here on a Friday and, uh, man, any last parting words from you? You know, whoever's listening to this, um, you know, whatever you do, you're going to hear a lot of people telling their stories. Uh, to me, so many times in life, you know, I wanted to find out what is going to make me happy. Uh, and so many times I saw external. Anytime I looked externally to become happy, it kind of bothered me until I realized happiness is stemmed from alignment. Let me explain. One is you need to know your values and principles. And once you have values and principles, if your behavior on the way you live matches your values and principles, you're happy. If they don't, you are living a conflicting life and you're going to drive yourself insane. If there's anything you can strive for in life, find a way to be aligned with yourself. You'll have a happy life. That's about the best way we could end this podcast or any podcast. I appreciate that advice. And man, I, again, I greatly appreciate your time and thank you for being on. Thanks for having me. All right, guys, with that, this is the Breadwinner Podcast. And again, I am your host, Tyler Harris. We'll see you next time.